Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. Welcome back to the Fading Memories podcast, everyone. With me today is Dr. Adrian Owen. He is a prominent neuroscientist known for groundbreaking work in neuroimaging and cognitive neuroscience. And those words are practically beyond my pay grade. So I'm going to let him tell you all about what he's been working on, which essentially is a screening tool, digital screening tool, for cognitive issues so thanks for joining me can i just call you adrian please do yes everybody else does yes so you awesome. certainly thanks very much for having me on um yes i'm a cognitive neuroscientist i work uh uh in developing various brain imaging methods things like uh fmri or functional magnetic resonance imaging uh, mostly to try and assess uh the effects of of brain injury but the other thing that I'm really interested in, which I think is the topic you know, we're going to be talking about today, is cognitive assessment. And for about the last 30 years or so, I have been developing a platform of, of cognitive tests that we're now turning to a particularly thorny problem, which is how do you predict who um, in you know, older age, uh, who is presenting, uh, those people who are presenting with cognitive impairments, uh, impairments of memory, uh, attention, concentration, these sorts of things, who's going to go on to develop uh, a dementia like Alzheimer's disease and, and who is either going to stay the same or is just, you know, feeling the effects of old age as, as, as we all do from time to time? That's a, that's a thorny question. And you've been working on that for three decades? I have, yes. Well, I um, in my my day job is as a professor at the uh, University of Western Ontario in uh, in London, in Canada. Um, but prior to that, um, I was in the UK in Cambridge, University of Cambridge, for uh, many years. And while I was there, I developed uh, a platform of of tests that have gone on to be marketed by a company called Creos. And the tests um, were designed to really try and get to the bottom of what causes certain types of brain impairment, things like memory, uh, things like concentration, attention, uh, difficulties with problem solving, decision making, planning, these sorts of, in a sense, higher cognitive functions, not things like seeing and hearing uh, or that they're interested. It's really thinking that really gets me going. And yes, actually, it was 1988 when I was doing my PhD back in the UK, I started working on this problem and and um uh, we took some some existing tests and and computerized them and then we developed other tests and as part of my phd back back then i would travel around visiting patients who'd sustained certain types of brain injury trying to work out what exactly is their problem what's wrong what does what does this type of brain injury caused in terms of changes in their intellectual or cognitive function. And then I would go back to the lab and tweak the tests to make them a little bit more sensitive to that particular problem. And gradually, over um, many, many scientific studies and some decades, we've arrived at, at, at Cryos, this online, uh, uh, online platform of 13 cognitive tests that really, I think, give people a, a very good snapshot, if you like, of their cognitive abilities, what your concentration abilities are like, what your memory is like, uh, how easily you can solve problems. Can you reason your way through to a solution? These these sorts of things. But most recently, we've really been trying to tackle this problem of uh, how this applies to dementia and how we can make use of this tool in uh, both detecting dementia and in predicting the trajectory of a, dement of a dementing illness. Predict, uh, predicting the trajectory. Geez, that's tricky to say. <laughs> Jeez, and I'm glad, I, I'm glad I got away with it there. <laughs> that, that would, I think, well, one, it would be scary, but I think it would be so helpful for caregivers like myself to have kind of a, a grasp on like what we're looking at. Like my mom started showing signs of memory issues in her mid fifties, her early to mid fifties. And she passed away at 77, but her mom lived to 91 with dementia. So, you know, I wasn't sure 
what kind of longevity we were looking at with her. And it makes it dang near impossible to plan. Because, and you yeah. just... uh, that's such a really excellent point. I mean, pe people often think that this problem is all about therapies and, and medications. And obviously, everybody listening to this will have been reading about, you know, new potential therapies for things like Alzheimer's disease that are coming over the horizon, where I think we're still some way off having uh, a, a something, you know, established and affordable. But um, nevertheless, these things are around the corner and they, they will come. And, and in those in that context, obviously, it's, it's important that we know who really has dementia uh, and, and who doesn't. But the context that you're mentioning, I think, in many ways, is far more important to most people. And that is, how do you plan? Um, you know, if you're in your 60s, your 70s, you're worried about your cognitive performance uh, and you go and see a, a doctor or a neurologist and they tell you you've got mild cognitive impairment, this may be the early signs of dementia. Well, you want to know one way or the other, you, you, you know, because if this is just the effects of aging that, as I've said, we're all experiencing from time to time, then fine, you have less to worry about. But if this really is the earliest stages of a serious dementing illness, then there are many plans um, uh, that need to be made and, and people really do want to know about this. So that, that's, that's, that's the nut that we're trying to crack right now. And I think with some success. That sounds terrific. I just did a recording. If everything works out the way my schedule allows, it should be the one that came out last week, the one be right before yours on how to have conversations with your parents about their health and their their wishes and how they want to be cared for and knowing having knowledge of what's going on in your brain what could be coming down the down the lane for you makes those conversations even more important and they might help stimulate them as well and i know from all the work that i do with the alzheimer's association you know we're really pushing for early diagnosis so that we can have these conversations so we can take advantage of clinical trials or the treatments that are out and i'm assuming that your screening tool helps a lot with that sounds like it would be like almost first in line for getting things diagnosed yeah i mean you're absolutely right i mean what you've said there basically is that knowledge is power and of course it is the more you know the better positioned you are to 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 make decisions and and you know i meet people all the time that just really want to know they want to know that information and yeah so Krayos, we've developed a tool um what i what i'm really the reason i'm so excited about this is because it was only possible because of really of the help of tens of thousands of members of the public so over the last about the last 15 years, we've been collecting data from members of the public that take part in our research studies. And sometimes these studies involve uh, 30 or 40,000 people and they log into the CREOS website and they essentially you know, donate their time and their brains to perform our cognitive tasks. And that's put us in a, in, in a position where uh, I think we have over 14 million tests have been created on the platform now, which... Um, I mean, everybody. Everybody's heard of you know, big data, and this really is big data. Now we have a lot of information about a lot of uh, people. Not not identifiable personal information about people, but about the relationship between lifestyle habits and and cognition and age and cognition and and the uh, and medication and and um, and illness and these sorts of things. And what we were able to do with the uh, screening tool was to combine all of this information and look for patterns in the data uh, that would tell us uh, or uh, help us predict who was going to go on and develop dementia. And the pattern that we eventually settled on involved just two tests that take about six minutes, two simple mm. tests. And again, I want to emphasize to people this was not something that we sort of dreamt up in a laboratory one day and thought, oh, yes, it'll be, we'll have one memory test and one test of concentration. This was really something that was came to us from the data itself. We looked at every possible combination of tests and, and worked out that two of them, two actually very simple, fun, gamified tests, could actually predict with a, a high, to a high level of accuracy which uh, people would go on to develop dementia from an, an early stage of sort of mild, what we call mild cognitive impairment or, or MCI. Now, the reason this is so important is because most of the tools that we have at the moment 
they can tell the difference between somebody who has dementia and somebody who doesn't have dementia. But by then, it's too late. And as we've already discussed, what you really need to be able to do is to tell the difference between somebody who is going to go on to develop dementia and somebody who is not going to go on to develop dementia. And the tool is very good at that. And it really has two, um, I mean, and that has two, two advantages. One is that we can focus our efforts on those people that need it most. Because, you know, there is an easy way to make sure you uh, spot every single person who's going to get dementia. And that is you do a full assessment on every single person. But of course, that's extremely inefficient and expensive. And you're wasting a lot of people's time and money. So what the tool does very well is it it sort of it sort of flags. It flags people um who should go on to have a more fulsome assessment. So it won't tell you about your level of dementia right now. It won't tell you everything about what's going to happen to you, but it will say, ah, this is a person of interest. This is a person who is very likely to go on and uh, and have full-blown dementia, and they should be monitored, they should be followed. But the other thing that it does is the reverse. It'll also say, well, no, this isn't the person who is going to go on or is likely to go on and develop full-blown dementia. This is a person who is experiencing the normal ups and downs of, of ageing, and this is within the normal range that we would expect for somebody, for example, of, of that age and that educational level, um, and so on and so forth. So, it's yes, it's, it really is a screener. It's something that we, we use really to work out where we should be focusing our efforts and who we should just leave be because actually actually they're fine they're fine so can you um i have have a tendency to hang out with a lot of people that are older than myself and i have i get frustrated that i have to correct them on the no that's normal aging um no that's not it's not alzheimer's just because you can't remember where you put your keys can you explain what normal cognitive issues with the aging brain kind of look like? I think I worded that properly. Yeah, well, I think um, it's exactly what ev everybody would think it is, which is that, I mean, it's quite typical for people to become a bit forgetful as they get older. It's quite typical for people to find that uh, they can't concentrate for as long or, or as accurately as they used to on a particular task. Mind wandering when you're trying to read a book, for example, is a, a problem that people you know often report. But um, the really important thing is we have to put that in context. And, of course, now with big data, you know, we can do that. We can look at the scores from hundreds of thousands of people that uh, have conducted those those tests. For example, I'm, I just turned 58 a week or so ago. Um, I, what I, can, I can dip into the CREOS database and I can look at how my performance compares to a uh, hundred, maybe a thousand other 58-year-old British men because we have so many people have provided their data. And that gives you a much more accurate snapshot than the old-fashioned method that we would all, uh, you know, just, just look up uh, charts of small numbers of university uh, undergraduates who'd contributed their efforts to, uh, you know, to give us norms scores. Now, of course, we can generate norms that really are very similar. And when you do that, um, in fact, I think the, the overall findings are really quite reassuring. So even though at 58, you know, I'm finding I'm not quite as sharp as I used to be, I'm not quite able to concentrate for as long as I used to be, my wife is constantly hitting the pause button on the TV because she realizes I've you know, lost the plot completely. Um, that's normal. It's normal for a, a person of my age and my my background. So, I think that's the really important thing. Uh, I mean, you know, obviously, that's not to say that everybody who's fifty eight and is experiencing cognitive problems uh, that that's normal. Obviously, I mean, this is why people should get it checked out. And one thing I say very often is we we manage to move society to a place that people now take their physical health you know, quite seriously. Uh, many people exercise, many people go to the gym. We're all wearing Fitbits and smartwatches to see how many <laughs> steps we can take. Yeah, likewise. That's great. <laughs> Fantastic. Now do the same thing with your brain. Care as much about your brain as you care about your body because it's the most important organ you have. Well, I do because as you've heard, my mom had Alzheimer's for 20 years. My maternal grandmother had mixed dementias, likely, definitely vascular 
My maternal great grandmother also had dementia. She died the year we were both born. So I'll be 58 later this year. So glad you got data on 58 year olds. I'm getting there. <laughs> um, so what was it in 2006? I went on a journey to lose weight, find what worked that would keep the weight off because I was trying to avoid the diabetes that is ever present on my dad's side of the family. And in doing exactly that, I learned that all of those efforts to avoid being coming diabetic also helped my brain. So I was lucky that I went down that path and, you know, having dealt with my mom for many, many years with her cognitive issues and all the frustrations that come with the Alzheimer's disease. It's like, nope, not going there. <laughs> so um, I have a new doctor and he will be told that I don't, I don't care about as much as other things as I do about brain health. It's like, I, I may, might need to bring a big label to put right on the front of my chart brain health that's all i care about <laughs> so we don't have cancers in our family um i will talk about the diabetes when when i have my appointment with him just so he knows it's there but yeah no nope, brain health is a daily daily thing that i work i work on i exercise i eat right generally sleep pretty well right now that's fantastic and uh, we, well you know we, we have the tools to do this now i mean this is the great thing that um uh, in the same way that we you know have smart watches and and fitbits and the rest of it we have tools for monitoring brain health and that's really what we've focused on developing at, at Krayos for uh, as i say the last 20 years or so is to try and provide tools that people can use uh, and this is the other point to monitor their own brain health i mean one of the other things that i think people don't realize is that or oh, they often don't realize is that um you know you, you don't necessarily have to go away to an expensive neuropsychologist or a neurologist to find out how you're doing we uh, you know we know enough about the science we know enough about brains and how best to assess brains now that we've been able to develop tools that can allow people to self assess or assess your spouse or your your brother or your sister your friend um the, this is one thing we've really uh, tried to do very well at Cryos is to make these tests are uh, not only available to people in multiple languages, uh, available and useful to people that have different levels of literacy. I know a lot of people worry about maybe I can't do those tests because I wasn't educated enough. Well, these tests are completely immune to the education that you've had because they look at broader aspects of brain function. It's not how much you know or whether you know the answer to questions. It's how you solve problems uh, in your head. And that's the sort of thing that's some it's largely unrelated to things like uh, education. Um, but but more importantly than that, I think the fact that people can, uh, th these tests can be self-administered um, or, you know, administered within the context of a, a memory clinic or a neurological clinic. Um, and we can we can answer the question, you know, is my brain as healthy as it used to be? Um, and is it is it the way it should be for somebody of, of my age and background? So now is this a test that one has to do in the in the medical setting or can they go to the website and take the test themselves like i could log off from this and go test my brain there's a number of different options i mean people should certainly visit the website cryos uh, dot com at c r e y o s dot com to um, to look at the options that, that are available um what we do is i mean it's it's it, it is typically um administered through a neurological clinic and there's i think more than a thousand in the in the united states alone that uh, that use the cryos testing um but we run research studies most of the time uh i mean right now we're doing one um uh, called the brain and body experiment where we're looking at the relationship between physical exercise and cognitive performance for example and you can access that from the cryos website and that would allow you to do all of the tests completely free of charge and outside of any medical environment because it, you are actually helping us do the science that allows us to make the tools better uh, and helps us to uh, put us in a better position for assessing people that really do need really do need help. So it's always anonymous. We're not going to use your medical information for anything. It's completely anonymous, but you'll tell us a few things about yourself. You'll do the test. We'll give you back uh, information about how you performed relative to people of your um, 
Asian education, um, you know, and um, we'll all benefit. It's a win-win. People will find out about their brains and their brain performance, and uh, and it'll help us uh, make the tools even better than they currently are. That sounds fun. I think I'll have to do that. So there's been a lot of a lot of there's always seems to be stuff in the news. I think I I see a lot more of it since you know algorithms push that information towards me, but they're. They're starting to doubt the amyloid theory that causes Alzheimer's. And there's a lot of, we can do a lot with lifestyle, prevent choices, better choices to prevent or maybe even slow down dementia. Is that that something you've kind of discovered in your research or is there something, what have you discovered interesting? (laughs) I think it's all probably interesting, but is there one like juicy nugget? (laughs) Um, yeah, I can tell you a juicy nugget, especially for older people. I mean, we we uh, published a big study in, in 2018, almost five years ago now, um, looking at the effects of sleep on cognitive function. And again, the great thing, because we had, I think, close to 20,000 people uh, logged into our website. They um, they did the CREOS test. They told us all about their sleeping habits. They did some sleep questionnaires so we could verify how much sleep they got. And we found out some really interesting new information about sleep. I mean, one of the things that I really thought was interesting was that, you know, obviously we know that not getting enough sleep is not good for our cognitive health, right? Everybody knows that. But getting too much sleep is also not good. It's, it's equally as bad for us, in fact. Hmm. So it turns out there's a sweet spot. I don't think people will be surprised. It's between seven and eight hours. But if you're getting only four hours sleep a night, your brain is suffering. You're not able to make decisions as well as you could with uh, with a, between seven and eight hours sleep. Um, you know, you're not able to um, solve the same sorts of problems, even every everyday decision-making. Um, but similarly, if you're getting 12 hours sleep a night, you're going to have the same problems. And I think that's the thing that was I had very much less... Uh, attention. I don't think people realize that it's not about getting as much as you possibly can. It's about getting just the right amount. Now, that's one thing. Let me give you another one for the uh, older people listening to this. Um, What we found that was very interesting is that, of course, as everybody knows, as you get older, people tend to get less sleep. They tend to sleep less. But the, the prevailing view has always been, well, people need less sleep as they get older. And our results showed that, in fact, this is not the case at all. People need exactly the same amount of sleep as they get older. Yeah, certainly people sleep less, but we showed that if they didn't do that, if they actually continued to try to get between seven and eight hours every night, they would remain cognitively uh, in better shape than if they just succumb to whatever forces are causing them to sleep less uh, and got less sleep. So it, uh, regardless of your age, you still actually need as much sleep to remain cognitively healthy, despite the fact that many people uh, don't get that. And in fact, um, we found that uh, half of our sample uh, were reporting getting six hours or less of sleep, which is really not good. Um, it's, it's It's extremely widespread uh lack of sleep these days and that there are very very well documented um effects that that lack of sleep or particularly lack of sleep but as we showed also getting too much sleep can have on the brain so yes so long asked your question but you know there are many lifestyle factors that are being shown um to uh they're not necessarily fully preventative i think that would be you know really would be an exaggeration but they can certainly assist in uh in keeping us uh, cognitively sharp, eating healthily, exercising regularly, and getting exactly the right amount of sleep are the three things to bear in mind, I think. Is there any theory as to why too much sleep is equally as bad? Because that's, I've never actually suffered from that situation because I don't think I've ever slept 12 hours unless I was ill. But I can tell you if I get a terrible night's sleep, there are days I'll wake up and my brain just, it just screams for sugary garbage. Like, fortunately, I'm smart enough to know it's looking for quick energy. And my answer to that is, no, you're not getting a donut for breakfast. That's garbage. We're going to have a nice, healthy breakfast. Maybe we'll take a nap out for lunch. You know, it's like <laughs> a donut is not going to solve the problem. But I'm shocked that too much sleep is equally as bad. Hmm. 
Well, the, you know, there is a phenomenon that's quite well understood known as sleep inertia. And that is the amount of time. I mean, everybody has sleep inertia. I'll tell you what it is. It's that feeling you have when you first wake up and you're a bit groggy. It's probably what most people equate to. I need a coffee um, <laughs> or I need a donut in your case. Uh, but sleep inertia is that that period that you have when you're sort of coming around from having been asleep and you need to really sort of get your brain back in gear and get going again. And it, it turns out that the longer you've slept, the more pronounced your sleep inertia is going to be. So, you know, part of this problem may be that, you know, if you if you had 12 hours of uh, sleep or you've, you know, you've been um, in bed for you know, a long period of time, then just overcoming sleep inertia is, is harder, getting your brain going again. And, um, you know, that's certainly one of the problems. But, uh, yes, this is a relatively new finding, and, and we really haven't got to the bottom of it completely yet at all. That's interesting. And normally I'm a tea drinker, very very much British kind of tea. Yeah, and, me too. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, no, I don't eat donuts because those are terrible for you. <laughs> sugar and fried foods those are two bad things plus you can only it's hard to have just one it's like no you gotta you gotta you gotta make pick better choices so i'll have the tea with a nice healthy breakfast but i'm i was a little surprised about too much sleep is bad but that's an interesting theory as to why and i'm assuming that it takes a little longer to buy get past the sleep inertia as we age because i'm kind of experiencing that <laughs> Right, right. That may yes, that may be true. That's not something we looked at specifically in our study, but I, it certainly, um, you know, there there are other factors, of course, involved there. You know, we're physically um, not quite um, the way we were when we were younger, so just sort of getting up and getting going has uh, a greater physical toll than it has uh, when you're younger, and that can give you the feeling of, of sleep inertia. But it's really a mental thing, sleep inertia. Is it? inertia? It's that. It's not really about physically being able to get out of bed it's about um being in a position where you feel that you're at the top of your game and you know if you had to make a, a life and death decision you really could most of us um just after we've woken up are really not in that position at all and it'll take it takes a little while to really you sort of for your brain to get back in gear and you to be able to um you know uh, be at the top of your game as it were have to shift it out of park and into first and then maybe second gear and keep moving. There are lots I, of, there are lots I, of I, analogies I, like that, and I think that's as good as any. That's kind of what it feels like for me. I generally, you know, you get to that point where you're like, oh, I think I'm awake. And then, of course, I have a dog, and she, she seems to sense when I'm awake, even if I haven't opened my eyes, which I think is fascinating. But then it's like, okay, what am I, I like lay there and I think about what am I having for breakfast? Because I'm not very functional until I've had some tea and breakfast. So that makes that first half an hour of the morning <laughs> kind of a little challenging. Yeah. But once I, I, I've read, I'll read a little bit and think a little bit. And then it's kind of like, I think I've got the gears warmed up and I can, I can function enough to make some breakfast and get the rest of the gears going. <laughs> What I find most fascinating about it is it's sometimes really difficult to to know that you are in that state. It's what we call metacognition in in neuroscience. It's that uh, that sense of knowing uh, exactly what your what state your cognitive faculties are in. I'm sure we've all had this experience where, say, you have to get up very early one day to catch a flight or to uh, do do something. You know, for, I'm thinking you know 4 a.m. Um, Often it, this happens to me because I, you know, I, I travel around quite a lot and I get up very early in the morning and I feel fine, especially if I've got to bed at a reasonable time. I think I'm absolutely fine. But then you strangely find yourself doing weird things or or accidentally dropping something or you know failing to notice something that should really be obvious to you. And it's funny this sort of disconnect between um, how well your brain is actually working at that time of the morning and how well you think it's working. It's really easy to deceive yourself into thinking you're absolutely fine when in fact uh, the signs are there that you're really, you know, you're not, you're not, you've not, uh, you've not got into first gear yet. <laughs> that is interesting. I haven't, I haven't had to get up extra early for a while. So next time I do, I'll have to keep that in mind. So as I mentioned, I have a new doctor. I'll be seeing him later this month 
if they're not using the Krayos screening system, should I suggest to them that they should? How do we get more than a thousand clinicians using this this test, this screening? Because it, it sounds like everybody should be using it and they should be using it yesterday. <laughs> well, it's I mean you I mean you could you could certainly contact uh you know Krayos directly, but I mean things are uh really accelerating. I mean in the last uh I mean I'm sort of thinking back 20 years ago, this was a really sort of small operation that it was just operated out of my lab. Um, Krayos became a company uh, about 10 years ago now. And since then, you know, things have really uh, accelerated to the to the point that, um, yeah, many in both the research and in the clinical context, uh, many, many uh, thousands of, of practitioners and clinicians are using the tool. So I think I, I mean, I, I think it's it's doing its job and as it's doing its job people are uh, are latching onto this and are uh, uh you know starting to to use it more so um yes I, I i don't think we need to worry too much about uh about uh you know becoming more more widely used because i'm very happy to see that's happening somewhat organically well that's good um that was that question it's like my brain's it's <laughs> we're having a heat wave in Northern California and my air conditioner decided to tap out. It's like, nope, not coming to play. So it's warm, <laughs> which thankfully I like it warm, but it does kind of slow down the processing powers going on in my brain. Cause I really would like to take a nap just cause I'm <laughs> like warm and cozy. Um, are you finding that more clinicians are becoming more interested in screening tools for cognitive issues? Like they're they much more aware of it. That, that they are. And if anybody, if there are any clinicians listening to this uh, this podcast and they want to reach out to Krayos, they should do it directly. They can, the, the website's very, very easy to find. Because um, I, mean, I tell you, there's multi, multiple reasons why this is the case. The first is, as I've already said, you know, there are more and more people getting older. Uh, <laughs> and of course, there are more and more people who are uh, suffering from conditions like dementia and and people want to know what's happening to them and happily we're in a position where we can provide tools that can help people but the other thing is um it's not possible to i mean the other thing that Krayos has i think managed to achieve is that it's not possible to send everybody that's feeling a little bit under the weather in as they get older off for a, a full neuropsychological or neurological evaluation it's just it's just not viable. And this is where I think clinicians are really taking advantage of Krayos. And that is you can use it as a as a as a quick tool in the clinic or you know in the surgery to um to actually get an answer very quickly as to whether this is a person who should be sent for a further evaluation or somebody who should just be reassured and told that you know that, that there's actually nothing abnormal. And um I mean, the, the other thing that's the other sort of component of the system that people often take advantage of is that you can you can test people over time. So, you know, obviously the, the sort of hallmark, if you like, of dementia is a deterioration in cognition. It's not if you if your cognition is static, it may be bad. But if it's if it's as bad a year from now as it was right now, you are not dementing. Um, and the other thing that we off, that we do is we, we we test people regularly and the tests generate unique problems all the time so you can't practice and get better at them uh, and we've had people that have uh, uh taken the test hundreds and hundreds of times um in order to monitor themselves over time you do it every month do it every three months whatever whatever sort of suits you uh, and that's another thing that clinicians can use to reassure patients because um you know if a patient comes back a year later and says, i'm still having those same memory problems Within six or seven minutes, a clinician could just administer the Krayos platform or the Krayos screener on an iPad in their office, just put the person in the corner and say, here, follow these instructions. It'll tell you exactly what to do. Look at the result. And if the result is the same as it was a year ago, you're not deteriorating. You're not dementing. Um, and, yeah, so I, I, I think it just makes the whole process much simpler it's it's much more affordable this is not ex expensive software um and it doesn't require any specialized equipment i suppose that's the other thing i hadn't mentioned i mean you could run it on anything on a desktop computer or on a uh, on a, a tablet an ipad type device um 
and it's all run online so it's there's not software that you have to you know, pay to download or it's it's uh it's all run online so it's extremely efficient and cost effective and easy to administer and you can get answers that give people um the opportunity to make plans if they have to cost effective efficient and easy those are my requirements for pretty much using any kind of tool or software <laughs> well I that's how you yeah, that's really important, of course, because we're often dealing with uh, older people um, that may not be as familiar with technology as young people. Um, and uh, I mean, that's why a lot of our efforts have been put into making these really user friendly. Anybody can do it. These are little games. The instructions are there. They, you have written instructions and verbal instructions. You have practice trials to make sure that you know exactly what you're doing before you get started. And And then, you know, we can really get really reliable data even from people in fact we've done it from people from four years old to 104 years old um it's they're, they're really very easy to use for anybody i would love to see the data on a four-year-old and versus 104 that's got to be fascinating <laughs> yeah well it is um they don't perform exactly the same way as i'm sure you'd imagine yeah i would i would be surprised if they did just just the difference in experience like your brain's got more knowledge just from living, which is interesting. I bet you right. back in 1988, you had no clue where this was going to end up so far. And maybe in another 10 years, Lord only knows where we'll be with technology. <laughs> That's true, but you've raised two two quick points that I'll make. One is that you know these tests are not knowledge based, right? So that's one of the beauties of them is that it's it's not about how much you know. It's about how well you can think. That's the first thing. Um, but the uh, the second interesting thing is we haven't mentioned is that different cognitive abilities change at different rates during the during the lifespan. So some things, and we measure this. Um, no one's going to be surprised to hear that memory is something that is affected by aging. The older you get, the poorer your memory tends to be. But things like your verbal abilities, your ability to sol solve verbal problems, to remember sequences of uh, digits, to do verbal tasks, is actually really resistant to the effects of aging. And, and right up into the 80s and 90s, we see people performing extremely well on, on verbal tests. So yeah, different cognitive functions are dif differentially susceptible to the effects of aging. That is interesting. What is more susceptible, like short-term memory? It depends. I mean, obviously, so I'm talking about healthy aging. So I'm not talking about somebody who has dementia or has a problem with their brain. But for the rest of us, and again, this has come from our database of tens of thousands of individuals. Yes, we see things like short-term memory deteriorate rather um uh linearly in a straight line throughout uh um your life uh i tell you reasoning and problem solving is, is even worse um it's something mm. starts off peaks in your 30s and then very quickly uh, starts to deteriorate after that so our ability to make complex decisions to reason to sort of think our way through to the solution of a problem that really uh is quite susceptible to the effects of normal healthy aging but as i say um a verbal performance um, is is hardly affected at all. Interesting. It's interesting that puzzling out complex problems is we could do that best in our thirties. So you and I are in trouble. <laughs> We're in trouble already. <laughs> I mean, I would have thought, based on experiences, we'd be a little bit better just because we've had to make more of those types of decisions, but. Hmm. No, interesting no, I, understand, I understand that that line of thought and again it's to do with the fact that these types of tests are not based on experience so even though yeah you may have made more of those decisions um we try to keep things away from uh tests that require knowledge so your buildup of knowledge that you have over time is not going to actually help you uh, and so and, and actually that's because these tests are really uh they're quite simple they're not really they're not like uh everyday decision making you know should i spend this amount on leasing a new car or should i spend this amount on buying a different car which is you know a complicated sort of equation that we have to sort out in our heads 
uh you know these are much simpler uh like you know what is the uh one of our tests is called odd one out is you know what is the odd one out of these nine shapes we give people nine shapes they have to work out which is the odd one out and there's no answer that you can get by just thinking oh, i in school i learned that the odd one out is this uh you have to work it out by looking at the shapes and their colors and their the numbers and and working out which one which one isn't like all of the others and as we know, that's something that we uh, we are very good at doing when we're younger. And uh, it gets a little bit harder as you get older. That's fascinating. I just love listening to people like yourself that talk about what they've learned about our brains because you've heard the term, you know, like space is the final frontier. I think our brains are the final frontier. I think we know more about space than we do about our brains. Maybe we're so <laughs> kind of, kind of, balancing that out a little bit more because i think we're catching up on the brain research but yeah well, we really it's... are i mean the last 25 years has been absolutely incredible in far, as far as advances in our understanding of the brain i mean really uh, you know i still consider myself to be relatively young um but when i started my career in the late 1980s uh if i could get back there now i would not believe how much we've learned and partly that's because you know, things have been invented that will be on my wildest dreams, like our ability to peer inside somebody's brain and see it actually working and do its doing its thing. Um, you know, I would have never have believed that was possible in my lifetime, but it actually happened relatively early in my in my career. And we're now really good at it in a way that doesn't harm anybody. It's non-invasive. Uh, in fact, it's, it's quite fun. I'll have my brain scanned any day. Um, <laughs> so you're talking about MRIs? I do think MRIs. It's MRIs, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it's it's amazing what we've learned, and it's amazing how far we've come in the last 25 years or so. And I'm sure, uh, much as is the case in space exploration and uh, anything you know, technological innovation, things are just going to get we're going to we're going to improve faster and faster all the time. And uh, so, who knows what we're going to know about the brain 25 years from now? I certainly don't. Me neither. But you and I will be around to find out. Well, I, I certainly hope so. I plan on it. As I mentioned before we started recording, and regular listeners know, my paternal grandmother lived to 103. So you got, what is it, 46 and a half or 45 and a half? I can do math sometimes. Um, years left to put up with me. So, gosh, all he knows what we'll find out in 40 plus years. Yeah, who knows? It'll be, I mean, it certainly it's going to be worth waiting for because um, uh, I think it'll be extraordinary. Again, particularly with the availability of data these days, the fact that we have so much data and we have the computing capacity to be able to analyze it on the fly. I mean, this is what we do at, at Krayos. We have on, you know, we're, we're analyzing data on the fly. So before somebody's even finished the test, we know how well they performed and how that relates to everybody else that's ever carried out the test. And we can, you know, we could download the data instantly. Back in my PhD days in the late 1980s and early, early 1990s, I would have to go back to the lab and spend three weeks with my calculator trying to work out, you know, what was going on. And, you know, now it's there in an instant. The person hasn't even sat down uh, and we have the results right there. That's just amazing. And it's just, yeah, like you said, it's just going to keep improving with, you know, however you might feel about AI. And I guess that's large language learning. All that data is out there. Might as well put it to good use. Yeah, exactly. No, I, I couldn't agree more. Well, as all my regular listeners know, the website is linked in the show notes. It's just a hot link. So if you're interested, you can click on it, go over there. Um, I have a neuropsychologist friend. I believe he's, I know he saw his first patient in his own practice. So I'm assuming his own, he opened his own practice. He's busy. So I don't always get, to, I don't always get the information right away, but I'm going to turn him on to this because um, he is very big on um, black men's mental health, um, brain health. So I'm sure he'll be absolutely fascinated to learn about this. So even if you're just a caregiver, I hope you guys enjoyed learning a little bit about what's going on behind the scenes and what we're learning in research and what we can accomplish. And if you if you feel inclined, maybe suggest to your general physician that they check this out. That way we can all get tested when we need it. So I wanna thank, thank you for, for coming on and explaining all this to us and explaining it to us in a way that the average person can understand. I always tell people if I was half my age and had twice the science ability, I'd go into brain research, but 
I'm an artist, so <laughs> and I'm not getting any younger. <laughs> well, thanks for having me on. It was an absolute pleasure. It was a great conversation. I really enjoyed it. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your podcasts.